Club Seni Surat The Art of Horror Club This is a download from BFM 89.9 The Business Station Hello, I'm Hanif Baharuddin and you're tuned in to the show that brings you closer to the people and places of our capital city. Malaysians love their horror, as proven by how well local films such as Munafik 2 and Hantu Kak Lima did in the cinemas recently. And with Halloween just around the corner, it's time we talk about the state of our horror products, be it in the form of films, music or even folklores and our reflections on them. So recently, I attended the launch of Club Sini Saram or the Art of Horror Club at an event called Scarefest 2018. The main aim of the club is to consolidate various horror products that we have from various platforms and find the best way to commercialize them in a sustainable manner. Of course, it goes without saying that Club Sini Saram also wants to be the collective in the country to gather all horror fans under one umbrella. You could say that with a rich horror narrative that we inherited culturally, coupled with our exposure to the horror genre in various formats from around the region and globally, the setting up of a club like this is long overdue. I sat down with the founder of the club, Vimal, and a local horror author, Magat Isha, after the event to talk about the horror scene here in Malaysia. Hi, I'm Vimal. Um, I'm the president of Club Seni Saram, and we just launched today. Hi, my name is Magad Ishak. I'm a writer of Hardcore and Dark Highways and Cannibal vs. Album. Okay, so we're here at the launch of uh, Club Seni Saram or the Art of Horror Club, right? So what inspired you to start this club, uh, Vimal? All right. Um, originally, it was a Facebook uh, fan page uh, called the Horror Club Kuala Lumpur. This was back about 15 years ago. It started with a bunch of friends uh, enjoying horror movies, um, Pergi Cari Hantu, and we were just enthusiastic, enthusiastic with the genre of horror. Fast forward to 2017, 16 actually, I started my production house, which is uh, Banvim Studios. And the intent that we had was to produce good horror content and commercializing good horror content to compete with the Asian market and the international market. We found a lot of obstacles, especially to the, in the mindset of the current producers, and they kept referring to horror as a niche market, not something exportable. I would like to quote somebody who who actually said that horror would not sell, and we should let jago kampongs do their work. So, I had to bring all my old friends back to show them that this is possible, and we officially registered in RO in ROS. Club Seni Seram or in English Art of Horror Club in July of 2018 to make it more official uh, one of our flagship shows is Skyfest uh, we've been doing this for quite some time this, uh, the Skyfest on the 20th of October this year is our fourth Skyfest and the most professional looking Skyfest ever so um, why do you think the horror scene is still considered niche in our society okay um, in terms of filmmaking um, the Malaysian filmmaking, I, I noticed they tend to go for good-looking film, good-looking people, and you know the A-listers in Malaysia are good-looking people, young and good-looking, <laughs> essentially. So they would think that would be the main thrust or the main or that's mainstream to them. Whereas horror, like what Vima said, is pushed to the side as a niche, and and it is wrong because at the end of the day, horror explodes. And when there's a when there's a wave, the next new horror now it's happening. The new horror wave is coming back again because it appeared in early 2000 and then it went down again and then now it's coming back again, and it's happening in Malaysia. And it's only right that we recognize and we do something about it. We should start to harvest our own country to find content to do proper horror films. And if I may add at this point that when you want to look for good horror movie, you need to get good horror stories. And it has to be something that is you can follow from beginning to the end. It cannot be something that you write. I mean, because most movies, I mean, not most, some movies, they just add things along the way, from my understanding. But we need a proper film, and proper film works if you have a story, a beginning, a middle, and an end. 
you know that everybody knows their place everybody knows their role everything then we can have proper storytelling proper film Mengalahkan bawa air penan orang <laughs> Kuda mana kuda? Kuda? Masuk hutan? Jawa akan bawa kali mahu hari ini Macam biar orang sih Are we very particular about The purity of The kind of content that we produce In the sense that Are we not comfortable with the idea of Hantu Kak Limah being a blockbuster because it's horror comedy and not just pure horror? Horror is horror at the end of the day. Whether it's in the vein of comedy or drama or serious, you know, or anything. As long as it entertains, you know, then to me it's a win, regardless. So we shouldn't think that the horror purity should be purely something scary, you know. There must be elements of comedy and action. Like, I mean, look at Mel Brooks' Young Frankenstein. That had good elements of horror, but it also was based on, on comedy, Mel Brooks, you know. And that worked. And I think there's nothing wrong, you know, with actually making a good horror film to have some elements of comedy. Apart from horror films, Malaysians are also quite blessed to be exposed to a very rich and diverse traditional horror folk tales from different communities that were passed down from one generation to another. Is there a need to understand and consolidate these different narratives, especially for a club like this? It's not about where the story comes from as long as it's Malaysian. And Malaysian stories are passed down from generation to generation. It's not that one community, community has, like Indians, they don't have their own stories. And Chinese, no, they don't have their own stories. Most of it, it's Malaysian stories that's passed down from generation to generation. So they have, I'm third generation uh, Malaysian Indian. I never called myself Indian. I've never been to India. I've always been Malaysian. And if you look at the Karya Karya that came in from, from 70s to the 80s to the 90s, uh, Malay, Malay stories, Malay horror stories, uh, writers like Tamar Jalis and we have those who have written many many awesome short horror stories for in Mastika, Varesari they were not about Malay cultures alone yes, the origin of the mythical creature or such maybe in Malay but it's been shared over different different cultures for years why are we still separating it? it's Malaysian stories we are rich in, rich in stories and here is where the kicker is we can't blame the culture or the people because producers and directors in our uh, industry, even publishers, they are not horror fans. Uh, they can't quote H.P. Lovecraft. They'll be asking, who is it? It's what they call a kapal terbang, hovercraft. Eh? They don't know who Clive Barker is. They don't know the arts of H.R. Geiger. They don't know who Magad Isha is. They don't know who Tunku Halim is. Yes. Yes. So... It's, we can't be blaming on the community when the front runners of the industry are not horror fans. They are not horror fans. We cannot blame the people because the people, if you notice, horror movies, however, how bad it is, you can actually just talk to people at GSC. Why are they still importing movies from Thailand and from Vietnam and still playing it? Why are they doing it? Because the market is there. Horror. Ram entertainment. Horror. Right? The reason why they're importing movies uh, because we don't have good horror filmmakers and by uh, Hantu Kak Lima was a good example thank you thank you for mentioning it earlier Hantu Kak Lima it wasn't the comedy angle that made it sell it was the balance between horror and comedy yeah. and Mama Khalid right it took him years to find the exact balance yeah. Thais were doing it for 10 years and they had the balance when they did parodies on Maynard 
called Don Don uh, Shudder Shudder Don Shudder uh, that was the name of it you can just google Shudder something right and they had good balance and Malaysia we never got that balance we found it now Muhammad Khalid found it now I love him for that but if you look at it to time the Americans found it first the balance between horror and comedy it was Evil Dead mm. Sam Raimi did it first Yeah, for a um, low budget, low cost horror comedy, it was scary and funny. So yeah, uh, to answer your question, it's not the community; it's the people, the, fr- the front runners who are supposed to get the knowledge. The thing is, you must be in love with the the whole industry itself. You must be in love with the subject matter. Um, for example, movies. You must be in love with movies. So you can basically, you know, I mean. All the information is at your tip, at your fingertips, at your fingertips. You know, you know which movie and in what context it is being played out. So when you love movies, you should technically love the genres in it, from be it action, romance, sci-fi, even horror. So if you are a movie lover, movie buff, you know you would know and you would appreciate. Even though you might not like movies, uh, horror, but you know it exists in the realm of movies. So back to what uh, Vimal was saying. Um, The powers that be, the ones that's actually running the show, they should be made up of people who know the movie scenes, who are aware of what's going on in the world, and not just be a bunch of pen pushers or bureaucrats who are just doing their job following policies. I mean, it should be like the stories and the movies first before the policy. You know, it should be that way. That's how I look at it. Okay. Um, we've been approaching it from an industry standpoint, and while that is crucial and also quite interesting, I am also interested in exploring. How we approach horror stories from the ground up, right? Because as much as we are exposed to our various types of hantus from the movie uh, screens, we also have various um, hantu or horror narratives that were being told to us when we were growing up, right? So, and I find that quite interesting because because the society and horror stories can't be separated in that instance, right? So, is Club Seni Seram gonna be focusing on those? Um, stories as well those folk laws as well as much as they're going to be focusing more on, on just the industry yes of course we have uh, our organization or the club we have broken into a couple of sectors right uh, the reason why um, when i say sectors is because it has it's not a money um, making industry yet film yes money making music yes money making so the mention of tradition and uh, to scientific approach is parapsychology kalau katakan let's just say we talk about the pontianak herself that story has been passed down from generation to generation to generation to generations right um when we look at teams so you can go on youtube and you can look for malaysian paranormal investigators right you will notice one thing that they all have in common the lack of evidence katakan pontianak tu wujud kan and they just show a video of a girl in white are you sure that's a pontianak Are you sure it's a long way, or is it an actress, right? So, cerita-cerita uh, rakyat, or I mean, sorry, cerita-cerita mythology. I'm going to call this mythology because it hasn't been proven yet. We don't call vampires in the West actual mythological beings, or I mean, we just call them mythos saja. We don't actually put them in a place where betul ni wujud. It's not there yet. So our aim under the paranormal investigation side, right, is to create a generation who ask questions. On the supernatural, have you seen hantu raya, Mak? Have you seen? Can you if you can, can you take a picture and self, uh, can I have a selfie with it? Yeah. So in order to have that happen, we need to push on this term called parapsychology, which is somehow somehow missed as an actual academic uh, subject in the pursuit of science. So yes, we have a group who which will be focusing on it. They have been doing a lot of daring investigations. As a book writer, your scripts has has a format right kalau betul tuan macam okay yeah so filmmakers we have the pre production the production uh, and then the post and then we have marketing for paranormal investigations we have the pre investigation we have the historical evidence we have the investigation itself we have the on site investigation and evidence review on site and then we have the post investigation which includes hypothesis theories and the biggest missing link is debunking So once you have an evidence, you you have to recreate evidence to see if it, if it does appear again, right? Or can we recreate the same scenario? Then we can debunk it. Ini bukan ini lampu double kereta. Wow, I find that quite interesting because uh, clubs in Seram seems to want to celebrate the horror in our society, and yet you also want to be academic about it in the sense that you want to 
also demystify some of these uh, mythologies, as you called it, that might not have been true and might have been passed down for generations without any any proper scientific investigations behind it, right? Absolutely. And um, why I'm going to call it an industry is because parapsychology is money making. We can approach Kementerian Pelajaran and Kementerian Pelajaran, Kementerian Pendidikan, mm. and approach them with a formal request to fund this kajian scientific, right? It brings money to those who have been doing it for free for the past 50 years. Kajian Pernama Sini is for free, a hobbyist. And by giving money to them, they will take it more seriously. But mythology and tradisi, right, is a totally different subject when it comes to Kelab Tani Seram. Because when it comes to wayang kulit, katakan wayang kulit, wayang kulit ada banyak unsur-unsur paranormal, kan, okay? supernatural. And if I'm not mistaken, Masuri's blood was white. So, unsur supernatural. So, that is also a different division from when it comes to paranormal investigations, uh, study of parapsychology. So, when you ask the question, right, it actually broke into a couple of subcategories. So, I answered the first one with parapsychology to make things, make things more serious for those people who want proof. So, that's what we are doing. As a local horror writer that's exposed to both the modern interpretation of the genre as well as the traditional narratives that we inherited, does Mekat Isha feel the need to marry the two worlds? Yeah, I've written a story called Sam. Okay, It's about this couple who... No, so it's about this young boy who discovers that the younger brother is, is not exactly a normal child and it turns out that the younger brother is actually an adopted son and in fact he's a Toyo. So I was going to bring down the, <laughs> the story of Toyo into modern day settings and how the young boy actually investigates his own brother, his own half brother like, to find out. So that was my attempt actually trying to bring forth, you know, these kind of um, elements into the um, modern day story. So basically, and how it actually, how it is still relevant, the stories are still relevant and how the scare factor is still there. So regardless whether your setting is in a kampong or in a condominium, the scare factor is there, you know, and that is the, that is the strength that that missions have in terms of actually mining, you know, mining this pool of mythological creatures, beings, entities that we can actually pick and choose which one we want, you know. And certain things like, um, we have a whole range of items. Uh, somebody shouted out there were 47 of these types of things out there. <laughs> in fact, it's been categorized. And if you were to like bring it to the world, you know, the world would be amazed. And what Vimal said about Penanggal being ripped off by Aswang. Aswang is a, it's a film, I've, I've seen it before. It's, the setting is in Philippines. But it's, it's, it's really good. You know? But the, it's the same concept. It's about a head that leaves the body, but carrying with all the internal organs, the heart, the stomach, the low intestines, the whole thing. And it just flies around. You know? And it's gone regional. Okay? So the thing is, um, we have to make ourselves recognised. And... We have to use our pool of stories, of cultural stories, like we must say, generational stories, and we have to bring it to the world. We have to make it, we have to present it to the world. Otherwise, it's going to be lost in time. Either that or even worse, it gets stolen. Talking about horror in the modern world is pretty interesting, especially when you take into consideration the multitudes of distractions that we face in our daily lives. For example, digital disruption in the form of social media might move people away from consuming or even entertaining the notion of horror in favour of connecting with others. Does this have the potential of threatening the place of horror in our society? I don't think so. I think it's quite the opposite. I think with technology, we are spreading the word. We are viralizing horror. And I think the wave comes with, I think it coincides with the financial economic situation of the country. If you notice, uh, when the, the cycle, the recession cycle happens, there's a surge for films. Because people are representing their fears about the unknown, meaning that the lack of money, you know, uh, financial problems. And it is represented by horror film. There's another way of how we cope with it. You know, that's how we look at it. Um, just to add to that, okay, my vice president of... Uh, uh, Club Sunni Suram is Zain Azrai 
and he he has Asperger's, which is a spectrum of autism. And for those who know how this this works, uh, they tend to be socially awkward. And having Zain on my side actually helped me a lot when it comes to numbers and predictions because this guy is good at numbers. So, economical factor is one. Yes, it is. But the other factor is the control of the non-fan, the producers that control film output. Um, here's an example. He predicted that it will, we will crash in the next two to three years. We will crash because the, fa- the fans of horror are not there anymore. Okay. We, are, we are looking elsewhere for good content. Uh, an example of this, if this was 20 years ago uh, in the peak of horror, let's say it's 1999, right? Your script about the Toyol, about the, uh, the brother with the Toyol, right? Would have been directed by uh, Hideo Rakata. Yeah, uh, if it's Japanese, uh, uh, if it's uh, American, let's say it may, it may be picked up by Sam Raimi if he's not he didn't do Spider Man, uh, and he is somebody who knows horror, and yeah, he would have been picked by a group of producers because that's uh, horror, right? And we had masters of horrors. Oh yeah, yeah, that's yes, those yeah. bunch of guys were actually yeah. masters of their craft, and yeah? yes. John Carpenter, yes. uh, Takashi Miike, yeah, yeah. they were masters, right? Yeah. And uh, they had their they had their art. Fast forward twenty years twenty years later, when the producer buys your script, I'm not sure that you will land in the same hands of an actual horror lover who knows horror. So the end content, even though the script is effective and it's strong, but when the visualization happens in the director's hands, it will sink. That's the biggest weakness when it comes to Asian content. The masters of horrors in Asia normally retire quite fast. If you know, if you notice, they retire very fast, or they move into other strain of media. Yep. And if you notice, Hollywood uh, has opened gates for a lot of big actors, and, and they started from horror. Johnny Depp, yes, started Nightmare. from horror. Nightmare on Elm Street one, right? And it gave them a platform to show them that hey, I'm a good actor. Come Malaysia, I'm it's totally opposite. They might be good looking and everything. That same thing applies to directors. Directors might have done one uh, art movie where it's about this bicycle that lands in a flats and whatsoever not. And then the next project is a horror movie. And that script might be, might be from uh, Tuan Magad. And it's like, well, wait, and what you wrote with what your visualization will never look the same for somebody who doesn't know your art or love your art. And most of the directors don't even talk to the writers. Yeah, like, yeah let's, let's face the facts, right? The wave will die if nobody takes over from here on. Mm. We don't have the talents. Do you think that, especially in Indonesia, we have reached a point where horror stories, um, like you said just now, have become predictable? Predictable? Oh, no, 20 years is still predictable. But it's not about the content. It's storytelling. And if you get good directors who know and love the art, um, giving them opportunities to make their own films, or me, uh, would give access to better non-predictable or just real or new to the Asian market which can ex- we can export mm. and just is about, it is about taking risks this industry is about taking risks horror is something that we we have to take a risk on right and how we convince the people who want to invest on us but picking right stories right commercialization seems to be the buzzword that you've been mentioning a lot um, throughout the event also throughout the interview right is that the ultimate end goal though yes indeed if it's if we have just hobbies, if we're just looking at it as a hobby, I think uh, I would not be self-funding this first event myself, because this is industry. If you like to put your voice to be louder, you need to have a reason, and that is to become an industry. Industry menjana can do it, and when the money comes, people will see oh, it works. When money flows, people will join us. Call me an idealist, but it's also about the art as well, right? It can't just be about money, right? Okay, uh, this one I think we will share this answer. Yeah. Yes, know the art before you make the money. That's the problem that we are, the people here are doing. This is, a, this is a mistake. We don't know the art. We don't know the art and we're doing it. So, but too, we fail after fail. We have failures after failures of when it comes to books, when it comes to film, when it comes to music, when it comes to, to, to even uh, Wayang Kulit. We, most of our people lost the art, right? Most of our people lost the art. When in Indonesia there's twelve dalangs, right? Uh, we have uh, Professor Foley from uh, from uh, the US. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, Professor. I think I'm not quite sure which you see from. I remember meeting you in uh, WCIT, and we had a full discussion about this, saying that they take this art very seriously, right? 
And they don't even take do wayang kulit shows without the audience understanding what it is or so not. I'm guessing there's some workshop before you even watch it, right? So if we have the best platform, we have the right people who understand, who love the art. That's where the money comes in. Kalau you talk, if you don't, you don't love the art. Hell no, you're gonna make money out of it. Um, the thing is, um, uh, this is to quote uh, Stephen King from his book on writing, and I really agree with him whenever I write. Is uh, he says that you write honestly. You write with honesty. You don't put on anything else. You just write as it is. So when you write with honesty, that means it it is coupled with pa- with passion. And when you have a passionate, honest writing, it will show in whatever format, whether it's a book or it's a film, it will show right through. So you get a director that understands the content of the book and sees the honesty in there, and he respects and maintains the integrity in the film itself. Then you get you, you get a, a sure win book or a film on that on that level. Of course, it's for the money, but then again, it's also driven by people who have a passion for it. Yeah. Does the art need to be preserved? I guess I don't know. I mean, because you guys are passionate in what you do, right? So, is there a, a need to preserve the art for the art's sake, as opposed to you know just thinking about generating money and things like that? Um, it has to be compelled by money because at the end of the day, like what Vimal said, we are do, we are creating an industry. If the industry is strong and it's thriving, that means I can leave my day job and become a full-time writer. But the thing is, I can't. And even though I would love to become a full-time writer, I just can't. I can't afford to. I, I got a family to raise. When a daughter's going to college, <laughs> stuff like that, you know. And the thing is, uh, but I still do it, you know, because I, I love it. But if I know that it's going to, you know, eventually lead to a film, and a lot of people likes it, and then there are more contracts coming up, then it might change my mind. I understand where you're coming from when it comes to when you say that art, 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 right? Here's the thing: we've been doing that for decades. Okay, art house. We have done film festivals. I think book festivals. We have done a lot of festivals for the love of the art, right? Where have that brought us? Do we have a growth growth industry and when it comes to the arts itself? How many? Okay, let's go back to let's the visual arts. Balai Seni Lukis Negara. When was the last time that anybody went there had a full house? I seen Karya once go down broke. Yeah. But the arts are, 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 are beautiful, and I I've, I've, I loved when I, in, in my teens I I I've, that was the newly opened Omba in uh, KLCC. I was in my I think my late teens, and I used to go there on all weekends with my friends, right? And I realized most of my friends didn't understand what they were looking at, and but I loved sitting there. Mm-hmm. I loved sitting there watching them do this stuff. There were artists that actually had uh, drawings and murals on the on canvases uh, on hand, and they were doing it. I loved watching it. Right, but fast forward ten years later, which when I want to go and see them, I want to discuss with them because I'm the kind of guy who's like, I, I, I'm curious. I like to know, but when I find out they pass, they they they're gone, right, and they're not here anymore. Even their art is like, it's it's most of the one some of his beautiful artworks are still in the garage. Nobody bought it. Uh, if if you want me to give another story, though everybody have their versions of it. Uh, yeah, these people screwed him. These people screwed them. Do you think Piramli should have died broke? If you had an opportunity to go back in time and fix it, first thing I would have told Paul Piramli was, "Bang, make a horror movie, lah, bang." <laughs> I got this nice stories about this bang, this couple that goes to in a cabin in the woods. <laughs> Oh yeah, another thing. If you want to be members of Club Seni Seram, please go to facebook.com slash Club Seni Seram. I don't know what I'm but just Club Seni Seram. Or email us at Club Seni Seram at protonmail.com. Be members because our next Scare Fest, we will have member exclusive uh, activities also. You've been tuning in to I Love KL and this week I had the pleasure of speaking to Vimal. He's the founder of Club Seni Seram or The Art of Horror Club and he's joined by horror writer Magad Isha. We've been talking about the horror scene here in Malaysia and what can be done to move it forward. And that marks the end of this week's episode of I Love KL. As usual, if you miss any part of the show, you can check out the podcast at bfm.my slash ilovekl or download our app via Google Play or the App Store. 
We're also available on Spotify now, so do check us out on that platform. And while you're at it, don't forget to follow the station on Twitter at BFM Radio. My name is Hanif Baharudin, and you have been tuning in to I Love KL, bringing you closer to the people and places of our capital city. Join us again next week on BFM 89.9, The Business Station. Thank you for listening to this podcast. To find more great interviews, go to bfm.my or find us on iTunes. BFM 89.9, The Business Station.